Well, uh, good morning. So good to be with you. Uh, thank you. It's good to be back. Uh, one more other announcement. It's really important. Uh, back in the summer, we hosted the Abounding Love Church here for a time of Thanksgiving worship, just joyful time. It was really wonderful. A lot of people said, boy, I wish more people had come. So well, we'll be sure to tell them when we do it again on Thanksgiving Sunday. That's tonight at 5 o'clock at Abounding Love. And I can guarantee you that at 3.30 today, I'm going to think, I don't want to go. Yeah, I'm cozy, I'm safe, I don't need to go anywhere. But then I will remember Albert's words in my ear that the only way racial reconciliation can happen in our city is when God's people worship together. And so it's really important for us to come out tonight. It will be joyful. Uh, our worship team will be there with theirs, and it'll be, it'll be a grand time. So that's my heavy push for that. I think it's important. Um, and now I'm a bit grieved because this is our last Sunday on First Peter. It's hard for me because it's been so... Um, exhilarating, really, to see that this once bumbling, uh, bombastic, over-speaking disciple of Jesus turned out to be you know, such a leader in the early church and have so much wisdom for us. But the last passage that we have is, is a wonderful one, so let's ask the Lord to do his work. Here we are, gracious Lord Jesus, expectant uh, that there is no one like you, but you are the God that wants to be known. You don't hide. Your word is an open secret. What needs to be unlocked is our hearts, our minds, our spirits. And so we ask, blessed Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Don't let us leave here the same. Let your word come alive in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So Peter writes, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. So be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, God himself, the God of all grace, will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion and glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. So wonderful when God's word is clear. Secret things belong to the Lord our God. That we may do all the words of this law. Well, I'm going to just highlight five aspects of this text as we walk through it today. And the first one is this. The first Peter starts out by reminding them, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Not usually advice that I really like to receive. <laughs> humble yourself. I'd rather not be underneath someone's hand. It feels like being under somebody's thumb. I'd rather be out from under somebody's hand, free to do what I want to do. But Peter's strong advice, if we want to be exalted by the Lord, is to bow the knee to bow the heart, to submit the soul, to acknowledge that life is about him, not about me. As our call to worship from Psalm 100 said, for it is God who has made us. We're not self-made, we are his. We belong to him. So I was thinking about that silent time of the prayer of confession after we say the printed prayer. We Stop for a minute of silence. And I wonder, what do you think about during that time? Maybe the score of the Tigers game, you know, how cold you were. Maybe about the fight you had in the car on the way to church. Maybe about the list of things that you have to do today or to get ready for the week. Our minds go all over the place. Sometimes to try to focus, I run through trying to remember the seven deadly sins and whether or not in those 20 seconds I feel any resonance, did I do any of these you know, in the last hour or day or so? You know, pride, check. Envy, oh, check. Anger, yep. Gluttony, sure. Lust, absolutely. Laziness, right. Oh, 20 seconds, all seven, all checked. That's convicting. But two weeks ago, it was actually worse because I didn't even get to that list. The time came to sit and be quiet, and all that came into my mind was, wah, wah, wah. 
me, 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 me. Nothing even specific. Just this sense of who are you before the Lord? Wine, 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 wine. All that he pours upon me, all that he gives me, all this privilege and things I should be grateful for. And I'm whining about some little thing. And it's always pointing back to me and my comfort in my life. It's what my grandmother called thinking only of self. Yes, convicted. And to me, Peter says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. It doesn't mean think less of yourself like, you know, you're a scumbag that should never have been made. But it means think less about yourself. Rather, get your head underneath the hands that made you, the hands that formed you, and to which you are accountable. It's something to think about God's hands. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, the hand that formed you and fashioned you, the fingers that knit you together in your mother's womb, that happened to be now nail-pierced hands of the one who was willing to humble himself, laying aside his divinity in order to pour himself out completely so that we could be exalted back into communion with God. Can I humble myself underneath nail-pierced hands and then discover the wonderful joy, the almost boundingly joyful, exultant truth of Isaiah 49, where the Lord says, Behold, I have engraved your name on the palms of my hands. If I don't get under those hands, I can't see that my name is already written into his wounds. I'm out about away from them, thinking I'm on my own. But when I humble myself and look at the hands that are above me, that are blessing me and guarding me and shaping me and protecting me, I discover that my hands have been, my name has been tattooed into the wounds of Christ offered for me. I think I could do that. Humble yourself under those hands of God. Number two, then he goes on to say, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. I love thinking about Peter, the big fisherman, using the word cast. Because fishermen in those days cast their nets. They cast them and they hauled them. They cast them and they hauled them. And in that first moment of his conversion, Peter had cast all night, all night long, And got nothing. And then the Lord overflowed his nets with fish so much that Peter realized, I don't even want them. I just want you. This is the one saying, so cast your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. It's interesting that word translated anxiety comes from a word that means part or fragment. Isn't that what worries do? They fragment your mind. You know, you feel for a moment peaceful, coherent, and then worries start pinging in, and they grab your attention away from the present moment. They grab your joy away from it into anxiety. They get your heart rate revved up. Anxiety decoheres us. It deconstructs us. Worries fragment us. So Peter is saying, cast these anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Don't let them fracture you. Well, that's a great thought, but just hearing that works about as well for me as when I'm revved up about something and Ron will say, stop worrying. Oh, okay, I hadn't thought of that. (laughs) If only you told me that 30 minutes ago, I'd not have a care in the world. Right? Nothing makes somebody more furious than when you tell them that. So how do we do it? How do we cast anxiety? Well, a couple of things. First, I think it's really important to be specific about what is making you anxious or worried because anxieties also creep in in unspecified ways. I don't know what I'm worried about. I'm just worried. I'm just worried about everything. I'm just, I'm just geared up. I can't, can't get a coherent thought. Stop a second. Put a name to it. I am worried about the meeting I'm going to have with this person tomorrow. I don't know how it's going to work out. That's the root of what's making me anxious and therefore cranky. Good. Name it. Put a name to it. And then, secondly, 50 years of Christian, I've only learned this really in the last year. 
Don't try to solve your worries for God. Mostly for me, I don't bring anything to him if I think I can solve it myself anyway. And somewhat that, you know, it's okay. If you spilled coffee, I don't have to pray to God about helping me clean up the coffee. I just clean it up. But then when I do bring it to him, something that I can't solve, I like to come with a solution for him. I don't want you to work too hard, God. I actually have a plan for you. Here's how you can help my worries. Would you do this this way? And then I leave the prayer session worrying about whether or not he'll give it to me the way I wanted it. Therefore, I've not stopped worrying at all. It was revolutionary to me to stop and just name an anxiety with no solution. Just say it. Father, I'm not sure I have the stamina to run from the time this alarm has gone off to when I can stop later today. Stop. Don't think about how you're going to solve it. Just give it to him. Father, I'm worried about how this person feels about me. I think this might be an enemy, and I don't know how I'm going to respond. Stop. Say no more. Just say what it is that you're worried about. Father, I'm not sure we're going to have enough money before the end of the month. We're going to run out of it before the month ends. Stop. It's revolutionary to me how simply naming the anxiety in his presence without giving him solutions allows the anxiety to shift from me to him and for his solutions, his solutions to appear later in the day or in the week. Try it couldn't be worse than our usual strategy. So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. And then number three, he repeats some advice he's given and then adds a nuance. He says, be, for the third time, be sober-minded and be vigilant. Remember, be aware of your life, what your purpose is, where you're going, and set out to be intentional about it, being focused. And then he gives the reason why. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Is that graphic enough for us? We have an enemy. There is a malevolent spiritual power that seeks to unravel your life and to consume you. His name, Diabolos, means the prosecuting attorney in a court case against you. His name, Satan, means the slanderer, the one who speaks truths or half-truths about you to bring you down. Peter says, you have an adversary. Don't be naive about this. Someone wants to mess you up. He likes to eat people, to consume them. He, all the dramatic ways, he loves the dramatic ways. Addicts stumbling around on the street, sleeping in pools of their own vomit. He loves that stuff. He loves the mutilation of bodies, the sexualizing of children. He loves the man who sold his soul to get wealth, feeling the stark emptiness of 50 wasted years pursuing the wrong thing. He loves that. But just as much as those dramatic things, he loves getting families so busy doing good things that they never sit down at a dinner table together. He loves getting us so financially extended, pursuing the good life, that when we become for a moment aware of the needs of the poor, we have nothing laid aside for them. Sorry, can't help, can hardly breathe myself. He loves flattering us about our physical prowess and our beauty and our social standing so that we'll spend endless amounts of time improving those and forget about depth of character. He doesn't have to entice you with bad things. Hey, why don't you become a drug addict? It'll be fun. He entices you with shiny objects, good things that end up leaving us as empty husks. And he loves to send someone to tell you a half-truth about yourself. True enough to make you feel stricken with shame. False enough to make you wonder and argue with it for the rest of the day or the week. But just as much, he loves encouraging you to be the enemy. For these things to come out of your mouth, these horrible things, half-truths about other people, blame-shifting, projecting. Great when Christians do his work for him. However he can get it. Shifting, sliding, devouring. 
You'll probably never see him like you would in a horror movie. He doesn't need to go that way. He just keeps showing up, twisting and manipulating things. All of that list, and I could go on and on about his strategies. Peter has two words of advice, curtly. Resist him. And then he adds, firm in the faith. All of these strategies, this lion roaring about, just say no. Just say, I see you, I'm not doing that. I see you, that's a lie. I see you, that's not what I'm going to pursue. Firm in the faith. The ESV says firm in your faith, but the Greek says firm in the faith, and I think that's really important. My faith? That's what I got to resist the chief adversary of my soul with? That is pretty poor goods. Because it changes with the biorhythm of the day. I might be hungry and full of doubt. I might be fed and faithful for an hour. I might be plagued with something that bothers my mind. I might be angry at someone. My faith is a variable and changing thing. To resist the devil, the adversary, I need to be firm in the faith. The faith that Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. The faith once for all delivered to the church through the scriptures, interpreted through the creeds, the faith that we confess every time we gather together. When the accuser comes, I've told you this before, but it's so apt. Say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to take that up with my lawyer, my advocate. First John says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Devil, I admit everything. I am way worse than you could ever, ever say. But he already knows that. And he paid for it. And any accusation against me runs through him. Get out of here. I'm not doing it. Not because of my faith, but because of the faith. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We humble ourselves, casting our anxieties on the one that cares for us, being vigilant to resist the devil strong in our faith. And then number four, he adds this really important clause to that. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. I don't know if you like to watch nature movies or not, or if you had to watch them in school, but you know how big cats hunt, right? They see a herd, and then they look for someone that is inattentive, weak, old, to break them off from the herd so they can consume them and devour them. That's what they do. That's how predators hunt. That's Satan's strategy. Let me get these Christians to think that their thoughts, their doubts, their sins, their sufferings are unique to them. Wow, none of the people in this room have ever had the thoughts I've had. I had better not reveal myself because then they might reject me. That's a laugh. Every thought you've had, we've all had them. Or I just can't believe that most people have to suffer this for their faith. They, these people don't have the boss I have. These people don't have the circumstances I have. No one has ever experienced this like I have. Sure, get broken off from the herd. Get broken off by shame. Get broken off by doubt. And you are prey to be devoured. Rather, Peter says, know something. Your brothers and sisters throughout the world are even now undergoing the same suffering and you are connected to them by the Holy Spirit, grafted into one body in Christ. This business about being Christ's body, it's not just a metaphor, it's the truth. If you are in Christ, you're organically, spiritually connected one to another. My suffering is your suffering and your suffering is my suffering. Draw on that, says Peter. You're not alone. You're not crazy. You have help. Don't get isolated. So then he says, I will tell you this example. We have time. One of my heroes, James Stewart, great Edinburgh preacher, was talking about what it means to suffer for Christ. And he was recalling a time in the 17th century when as Scotland was going through political and religious turmoil, 
everybody was always trying to try each other for heresy and put the other side to death. So depending on which part of the one true church had political power, they were trying to kill the other part of the one true church. Just my opinion. But the story goes that a young Presbyterian minister named Hugh McHale had been tried for heresy and was found guilty and was going to be sentenced to hang in four days. So as the guards led McHale through Edinburgh, crowds had come out because that's what crowds do. We like to see people who are tried and suffering. But also because he was a young, dynamic preacher, very handsome, and their hearts were moved. And as he walked through the crowd with guards on either side, his face shined with confidence. He called out to the passers-by, trust in God. His eyes shining with tears, trust in God. And then he saw a friend of his in the crowd. And he said, good news, good news, brother. In but four days, I will stand before the face of Jesus Christ, my Savior. That's faith. That's the witness that the suffering that we undergo for Christ's sake, whether it's just feeling weird or it's losing a job or going to the gallows, is not a new experience. And there are those who report we have suffered for Christ and it is worth it. That's why I keep urging us to become aware of the world church. The hundreds of millions of Christians who suffer persecution and report to us it is hard and it is painful, but we have not given up and it's worth it. He's with us. He will see us through and he will see you through. Around the world and through the ages, we are all connected. So that leads us to the last one. Peter says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace will himself confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Now, my immediate thought went to, how long is a little while? Because if you're in the dentist chair and you hear that drill fire up with that whine, 10 minutes is a year. This is long. How long is a little while? Is it for this season of your life? The comfort we can give to one another to say, I know your heart is broken, but it won't always feel this way. It will become integrated, that sorrow, into your life, and you will feel wholer again. Or is it the rest of this short life? What's a little while? How long do we have? A month? 10 years? 50 years? 60 years? Compared to eternity, our whole short life is a little while. What's Peter telling us? Peter, who would be crucified upside down. God himself will restore you. He will recreate you. He will bring you safe to the other side. He will establish you. You may get some respite here in this life. You may get some encouragement. You may have other seasons. You may not. But it's only a little while. You are on your way to glory. So, dear ones, this Thanksgiving week, as you sit down to your feast, humble yourselves before the one who has given you every blessing. Name and cast your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Be vigilant that you have an adversary. Resist him. Out his strategies. Know that you're not alone. You have a church full of people undergoing life shoulder to shoulder with you and around the world undergoing the same types of suffering. And be confident of this. The God who called you to himself will restore you, strengthen, and establish you. And know that as we sit down to eat, I will be thinking of you with great thanks for the faith that you show, for the love that abounds in you, for your hope in the gospel. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have undertaken so great a salvation on our behalf, and you have completed it. Grant us grace and confidence to walk before you in honesty and truth that the world might know that you are our Savior. Amen.